I'm Terrence Barkin, the Executive Director of the Graphene Council. We're very proud to host today's webinar on graphene oxide key applications. And I'd like to start by just explaining a little bit about the Graphene Council. Before we get started with that, I want to make everyone aware that we are subject to antitrust regulations. We have companies that are working in the same sector. And so these rules apply anytime there's a Graphene Council meeting. We just want to make you aware that we follow these guidelines. The Graphene Council was formed in 2013. And since that time, we've created a network and a community globally of more than 27,000 material scientists, R&D professionals, and specialists that are studying graphene, producing graphene, and using graphene commercially. It is the largest group in the world by far, and we're very proud to have that large community join us today on today's webinar. The Graphene Council has members that include academics such as the University of Manchester, the University of Warwick and Drexel University and others, and we have many intermediary companies, graphene producers, and end users such as Ford Motor Company, and most recently, Vittoria Tires have just joined the Graphene Council. What I want to represent here is that we have the entire ecosystem within graphene. And so whether you're a producer or a user, or you're looking at considering using graphene, we have a network that can help you do that faster and better. The reason why graphene is so exciting is that it can be applied to so many different applications and in many different ways. And here is a list of more than 45 that we've identified where graphene has some real application. And specifically today, you're gonna to hear more about that, in particular, how does graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide apply to these different application areas. Graphene as a material is not one thing, but actually many things, it comes in many different forms. Graphene from a scientific definition is a single atomic layer of carbon with sp2 bonded carbon atoms in a honeycomb uh, lattice. The reason why graphene has attracted so much attention uh, since it was first isolated in 2004 and for which the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2010 is that it has some extraordinary properties being the lightest thinnest, strongest, most electrically conductive, and most thermally conductive material that man has ever been able to isolate or produce. Production methods are typically what we call top down and bottom up, although there are additional methods, including something like detonation and other unique methods for producing graphene. But typically graphene is produced from a feedstock like graphite, where it's exfoliated down or from a carbon bearing gas where it's built up. Graphene can come in many different forms, as I mentioned, so that can range from a single layer of carbon, what might be produced by CBD production methods, or what is referred to as pristine graphene, could be very few layer of carbon, one to three, and et cetera, on up to in excess of 10 carbon layers. And there's material that has multiples of that, which still has great utility from a commercial perspective. In addition to that, and the reason why we're having today's conversation, is graphene can also be produced in a form called graphene oxide, where approximately 35% of the material is oxygen by weight, and its cousin, a reduced graphene oxide, which is typically made by a reduction process of graphene oxide, can reduce that to where uh, it's less than 5% oxygen by weight. But you'll hear more about that from our subject matter experts. Graphene can also be delivered in the form of a powder, a solution, or a solvent, or in a paste. You have it as graphene nanoplatelets, and there's also the functionalization of these materials, including graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide, which simply means adding other species or elements and molecules to the graphene material on the edges or on the surfaces of it to change its properties. So graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide are extremely interesting materials for a number of reasons. As I mentioned, graphene oxide can have a wide range of oxygen content by weight and it makes it hydrophilic, so it's water soluble, which is extremely interesting for many coatings applications, just as one example. It also turns graphene into an electrical insulator. It can be comprised of single or very few layers of carbon, and it can be functionalized, whereas reduced graphene oxide has the oxygen reduced or removed out of it to uh, bring it down to maybe three to 8% by weight, and it makes it hydrophobic. It also turns it into an electrical conductor, it also consists of single or very few layers of carbon, and it also can be functionalized. And the reduction process, which again, you'll hear about in just a moment, can be done after the graphene oxide is produced, but before it's used in an application, 
or it could be actually done in situ where the oxygen is reduced after the graphene oxide has been applied. So that gives you a lot of different production flexibilities and application flexibilities. So that's just a very brief overview. And now we're going to hear from Dr. Bayan from Standard Graphene. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. He's going to start sharing his presentation, and he'll talk about the material that's produced by Standard Graphene and uh, the application areas, a few of the application areas that they have found for that material. Hello, uh, I'm Ch Chan Byun at Standard Graphene, and I'm working as a senior researcher there. And good morning or good afternoon for everyone. And especially, I'm thankful for you all of guys as well as Harris for providing us a great opportunity for introducing our recent activities and our company. The contents consist of three parts, the company overview and the main body, the three application areas and studies, the water treatment, textile coating, and heat dissipation coating. And finally, I will talk about our some other activities. Uh, so let me briefly introduce Standard Graphene. Standard Graphene has, has been over eight years since uh, our CEO, Lee, started the company. We are located in Ulsan, Korea, and main product of us is graphene powders. The GO, the graphene oxide, and RGO, reduced graphene oxide powders. The uh, overall capacity is about 2.5 uh, tons per year, including GO and RGO. Uh, as widely known, the GO is made from graphite, via a modified humorous method which associate the use of oxidant and uh, sulfuric acid. Uh, as a result, many functional groups occur in GO, such as carboxyl, epoxy, and hydroxy groups. GO can be an optionally turned into RGO by reduction, and its oxygen content is much lower. So you can say, as you can see, in case of our product, the oxidant contents, so a little less than 10% for GO and a little less than uh, RGO and a little less than 50% for GO. Uh, our AFM characterization represents that GO flake is nearly a monolayer. And in case of RGO, typically six to three uh, layers of carbons. Our GO and RGO have a huge number of potential application areas, such as energy, composites and coatings, biotechs, display, electronic devices, and water filtration and treatment, which covers much larger areas compared with the CVD graphene. Now, let me move on to the next chapter. Let me start today's main topic with first item, the water treatment. The super graphite, is specially designed RGO-based powder product aiming at water filtration area. It can be compared with activated carbon commonly used in water treatment. Compared with the uh, activated carbon, it doesn't build up turbidity and it has much superior performance in remo removing color, COD, turbidity, and it has much superior uh, performance in phosphorus as well, so which open up many application areas potentially, such as uh, industrial wastewater treatment, water treatment plan, and post or pre-processing of pre-installed processes. Based on our super graphite, a water treatment facility has been installed and successfully operated in children's school in Nepal. It can accommodate 700 people with a thousands liter per day capacity. You may concern about the price, but the price is estimated to be only about $0.1 per liter, which is actually even much cheaper than we can directly buy, buy water in Nepal. And additional facilities in Nepal and small villages in Korea are under pre preparation as well. And for your information, um, the uh, installation installed facility consists of our super graphite composite filters and carbon block and microfilters, as shown in this figure. In addition to the filter uh, facilities, we are developing various types of uh, filter modules 
and systems, including annular tie filter, fluid filter, vessel tie filter, shower head, kettle, uh, bottle, and carbon block, and uh, many types and trying to commercialize them. Based on those filters associated super graphite, we produced various results for water treatment in terms of uh, color, NTU, COD, hardness, TBS, bacteria, and etc. Now let me talk about uh, the second topic of today, the textile coatings. This consists of two parts, the uh, antibacterial coating and antistatic coatings. First, regarding the uh, antibacterial performance, um, we tested using a non-woven felt and GO spray coated on it to see how much Staphylococcus aureus and pneumonia survive. And the results show that both bacteria dies by 99.99% .99 by using our GO solution. Uh, this can be attributed to a sharp edge of GO as well as its oxidation ability on the organic cells. For antistatics, uh, graphene was spray coated on two types of ny nylon based fabrics to examine the antistatic voltage before and after washing. Uh, as a result, it was surprisingly confirmed that the antistatic voltage after washing, after laundry, was greatly reduced and when considering that the high voltage of nylon is about 4,000 volt, it was confirmed that the addition of graphene can significantly reduce uh, the high uh, voltage for the static behavior. The final topic is the heat dissipation coating. We synthesized a graphene powder-based paint and applied it onto LED heat sinks. As a result, the LED temperature reduced by about five degrees Celsius on average, which can raise the energy efficiency and lifetime of the LED modules, as well as other kinds of electronic devices. And we are develop, uh, trying to develop uh, graphene-based TIMs. Uh, as shown in this figure, there are many types of TIM, and among various types of TIMs, we are particularly focusing on the thermal grease for the moment due to its uh, versatility and popularity. We made some samples and conducted tests. Uh, and as shown uh, in this figure, uh, in this uh, document, the thermal conductivity of our graphene assisted TIM is much larger than five watt per meter Kelvin, which is much larger than that of the commercially available TIMs, which ranges from three to four watt per meter Kelvin. It is a remarkable result actually, and we are trying to analyze the underlying physics, physical reasons. Uh, in regard to the thermal performance of the aforementioned thermal paint and TIMs, I come up with a responsible physical mechanisms. As widely known, the heat transfer takes place due to three mechanisms, the conduction, convection, and radiation. Here are two mechanisms, conduction and radiation, associate. The first, the conduction. As shown in this figure, only 0.005% uh, of the graphene can cover the metal surface by half. And once the surface is fully covered with graphene, assuming the layer number is three, so, uh, if you take a look at this figure, the theoretical prediction for the thermal conductivity amounts to the order of 2,000 watt per meter Kelvin, which enables a better conduction spreading. Second mechanism is the radiation. According to uh, the famous Stefan Boltzmann's equation, the radiation heat transfer is proportional to a surface property called emissivity, the epsilon. Albeit, it depends on situation, the emissivity of graphene is thought to be high. Of course, it depends on the layers and other circumstances. So it approaches almost a unity. So it may enhance the radiation heat transfer as well, as far as I think I postulate. Finally, I will introduce uh, our some other activities. 
there is an institute called CRIS, uh, Korea Research Institute of Standard and Science, a uh, kind of a Korean NIST. So it approved a CRM. So what is CRM? The Certificate of Reference Material Approval for BEP test to a standard graphene product. The BET test is a popular characterization method for nanomaterials, which is used for measuring the specific surface area. Uh, for your information, there are three uh, nanomaterials which gain the CRM from CRIS for BET. Among them, uh, our graphene product is the only material which is produced domestically in Korea. And we achieved certificate of NSF, the National Sanitation Foundation, designed by, uh, designated by WHO as an experimental institution of drinking water and water purifiers. So we get two NSF items, 61 and 42, which are for drinking water system compounds and drinking water treatment units, respectively. Uh, in addition, we are planning to get NSF NC401 and the testing regarding that is underway. Thank you for listening and thank you again to uh, Terrace and all of the uh, audience. Well, Dr. Bain, thank you so much for that. Um, appreciate that presentation. And, and while you go ahead and stop sharing and then uh, Rune is going to prepare his presentation, I want to just make a couple of observations on what you just presented. I thought it was astounding if you looked at the heat spreading application, I think it was 0.005% uh, concentration of the material. So um, for those of you who are not that familiar with graphene or looking at applications, you will undoubtedly have heard that graphene is an expensive material. But what you will see over and over again in many of these applications is that graphene can be used and applied in very, very small amounts. So again, just to continue that, it's, it's very small amounts of material that are used. And, and as such, then there's really not, um, cost becomes much less of a factor because we're using so little of the material. Um, and despite that small amount of material, you see that the improvements you get in terms of percentage uh, performance over uh, competing materials or legacy materials is quite significant. So this is why graphene is just so exciting is you can use very small amounts in, in these applications, get great improvements, and, uh, and it helps to mitigate the cost. So thank you for that. So Rune, uh, you're ready to go. So uh, the presentation's all yours. We'd love to hear about your company, your materials, and your applications. So thank you. Yes. Thank you, Terence, for inviting me to present in your webinar. So uh, we, were, um, we started working with graphene oxide already 12 years ago, making one gram. And with this one gram, in our first project, we made 2,000 samples for transparent conductive coatings. That took one year with a robotic uh, setup. After one year, we had to make another gram. Then we were approached by a company from Japan who said, why don't you scale up um, production of graphene oxide so we can sell graphene oxide in Japan for you? And that's how we started with scaling up, which has become our business. So basically, we focus 100% on supplying larger quantities of graphene oxide. But we also sell and give samples to universities and any groups that do interesting research on graphene oxide, um, like spreading our genes the most we can all over the world. We have customers on all six continents, and we are now setting up a three kilogram batch reactor to prepare for what we hope next year will be a fully automated line with a six kilogram reactor but that will be done in uh, in uh, response to market demand of course so we are also reach registering this year to to be prepared to produce more than one ton per year so a little bit about graphene oxide which we have most of these details have been um, computed, communicated already by terence and dr bayon I will just repeat that graphene oxide is very different from graphene. 
it's as different from graphene as iron oxide is from iron, but by reduction, it can become graphene-like, so-called RGO, which is also graphene structure, but often in stacks of a few layers, and also with a lot of defects, and still some functional groups. It can have from typically from um, 15 to 0.5 percent oxygen depending on the reduction method. So in the lower left corner, you see a AFM image of our graphene oxide showing single layers prepared from a suspension which was less than one ppm dried on a mica, um, sorry, silicon wafer. And the two small yellow spots are two small single sheets on top of these larger single sheets, which happens when you dry a drop of, of suspension. So on the other side here, we see reduced graphene oxide, magnification of one million, showing a peculiar cellular structure, which is typical of a thermally reduced re re graphene oxide with um, stacks of, on the average, six layers. So the surface area is about 400 square meters per gram, whereas graphene oxide has 1,600 square meters per gram when fully dispersed in deionized water. So we come to applications. Actually, I looked up historical data of applications published already in the 60s, and those were water filtration, interestingly which I guess people generally don't know was proposed in the 60s. And the other application proposed in the 60s was rocket fuel. I've not heard anybody talking about that now. So we work with a few industries, which is really valuable because um, then we get feedback from real end users. So the first one is Aura Sound in Canada who make loudspeaker membranes. This loudspeaker membranes is almost like nano chip boards. Uh, graphene oxide sheets glued together with a special proprietary process they have. And these loudspeaker membranes will have a potential of um, half a billion membranes per year for mobile phones, smart loudspeakers, and all that sort of things. So they will save energy, and the performance is much better than cheap uh, aluminum and, and um, paper membranes. Uh, the other partner we work with is Provexa in Sweden, who had already, when we knew them, developed together with Chalmers University in Sweden, a graphene oxide co coating, which is, according to another Swedish company, industrial company, the best anti-corrosion coating they ever saw. It's used now on typically on lamp brackets for Scania trucks commercially. The consumption is not that large uh, because this layer of graphene oxide is so thin, they probably coat approximately a few hundred square meters with one gram. The next one, we established eight seven, eight years ago, a company to utilize graphene oxide in batteries. And we landed on working with lithium sulfur, where it was already known that graphene oxide has a role in um, stabilizing sulfur in the cathode. So lithium sulfur batteries can potentially be used in aircrafts, and they are already used in some drones because the mass is potentially half lithium-ion batteries. But still, the cycle life is not so good, so that's what everybody work on. And uh, we having access to our own lab with the graphene oxide, modifying, optimizing the graphene oxide, we obtained really promising results. And now, only a few months ago, 
I sold my ownership in this company to a new Norwegian battery a company called Moro Batteries. So it's also freed up some resources to, um, to invest in um, Avalonix, which I use now for the scaling up. We also work with some other industries like a European producer of elastomers. Um, elastomers are potentially interesting markets for um, graphene oxide. And uh, with all these different applications, you realize that for each application, there are different requirements for the properties. So we fine tune together with the industrial end user, the properties for their application. So that's our business. We don't try to develop any products. So now we do what we are best at, producing graphene oxide, and we're working with the end users together. So there are lots of applications out there. Polymer composites, antibacterial, antiviral coatings, of course, this year. Application in oil and gas industry, decontamination of water, desalination, supercapacitors, sensors, photocatalyst, EMF shielding, soldering past for paste for electronic components, just to mention a few. So somehow my task is to sort out and find out which of these have potential to become real industrial products, not to waste time on things that have no future. We recently developed a glass coating, RGO coating for glass fibers, which I think have potential in composites or um, reinforcement in plastics, polymers. And also one of our researchers made this graphene oxide covered with tiny titanium oxide nanoparticles. And similarly, we have another researcher who made um, graphene oxide with magnetic magnetite nanoparticles that make them easy to separate from water. So we do that sort of things, uh, but we don't do the final products. We also participate in a lot of collaborative um, R&D projects, European projects and Norwegian projects. So we have one for thermal interface materials with some partners in England. We are doing an internal project with Sintafir for electrospraying thin, super thin coatings of graphene oxide together with other components. A uh, Mononet project with uh, partners in Romania for, to, to, to use graphene oxide for nonlinear optics on glass, typically stop laser beams penetrating glass. Karmov CO2 capturing EU project with many partners from all over Europe. Heroic. We have a project with Oda Sound in Canada to, to, to do optimize further uh, graphene oxide for the loudspeaker membranes. We have a project with partners in Greece in uh, geo and RGO for asphalt. We have a project with uh, partners in Taiwan and Europe for fuel cell membranes. And finally, one EU project to make we make the graphene, reduced graphene oxide, another partner makes the inks to, to print sort of um, features to, to, to monitor body functions. So here is my contact information. Please contact me whenever. Rune, thank you. That's, uh, I, I think that last slide in particular demonstrates the versatility of this material and the wide range of applications. Please note that our next presenter had some audio difficulties and we apologize for the sound quality. Thank you for your understanding. Great, thanks, Chair. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, people. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm Mike Butler, work for William Blythe, and I'll tell you a bit about our company, uh, Graphene Oxide, and I'll give you a couple of example applications. So before we start, I'll say thanks to Jack Carroll and Cameron Day from our company for their help with the, uh, with the presentation. Right, so we're somewhat different, I think, from most graphene and graphene oxide companies. We're 175 years old, uh, founded in 1845. We're actually a specialty inorganic chemicals manufacturer based in the northwest of England. So we were started out as part of the, uh, the textile industry you know, back in the 1800s. So we're very much a chemistry innovation business. Um, we've been very agile and uh, 
survived throughout the years by adopting different models and uh, developing new materials and always being at the forefront of the market. Uh, today, we sell to over 40 countries, have a team of highly skilled scientists, engineers and technicians, and sell products containing compounds and elements such as uh, zinc, tin, copper, iodine, and of course, uh, graphene oxide. I should say we're also part of uh, Synthema, so we're part of a larger group company, a uh, 2.1 billion revenue company uh, based in the UK, although with global for print and global sales. Synthema's uh, top five global supplier of emulsion and specialty polymers. William Blythe is part of the industrial specialties division of that. So clearly very interesting in terms of looking at polymer applications. We have lots of links in the company, and so things like elastomers and, uh, and polymer composites. So a site overview to give you a feel for, for our size and our manufacturing. Here's our site in the northwest of England. Uh, we have five, five plants making our different products, as well as a pilot plant and full quality control and R&D facilities which support product development and uh, new products. We have our own wastewater treatment facility, which is very important for uh, production scale and uh, pilot scale work. And we're also a top tier coma site. So in terms of our regulatory envelope, we have the appropriate permits that let us uh, work on a wide range of uh, hazardous materials and all sorts of materials. They're actually are quite hard, hard to work on. So we have extensive experience working in all sorts of materials and we can take uh, those materials to industrial scale up to thousands of tons. So we have ISO accreditation, um, for quality, for environment, and for energy. And we also have a silver rating from Ecovardis in terms of sustainability. So a wide regulatory envelope, but let's play with a lot of things. Um, so we're very much an inorganic chemicals business, although graphene oxide is an increasing and growing part of our portfolio. And for reference for later, for those of you who want to look at the presentation in more detail when it's shared, uh, we supply into several verticals and we have a wide range of products. This is a list for you to look at later in your leisure. You'll see graphene oxide in several of those verticals. So we have various sales as well as development and R&D activities. Okay, so in terms of our material, we use um, a form of the Hummer's synthesis method. So uh, well-known technique, our material is uh, very much similar to the other materials you've seen today. So we're greater than 30% oxygen content. We use both XPS and ICP OES to analyze our material. So this is on our technical data sheet that you can find on our website, uh, gographene.com. So for more information and uh, should you want to get any, any commercial sales, then uh, we're happy to take your contact from there. We use a wide range of techniques. So uh, FTIR, um, X-ray um, diffraction, XPS, UV vis, and Raman spectroscopy to characterize our material. And it contains all the expected and usual oxygen functionality that you expect in graphene oxide. So very much a well-known and standard material. And looking at the structure, it's predominantly mono and bilayer. So looking at AFM and SEM, we characterize our material. Natural dimensions are between two to five microns. Um, flakes no, no greater than nine microns in natural dimension. We do, um, we are able to make smaller and also larger flake by changing the graphite source. So by playing with processing and the raw materials, we can adopt a wide range of structure. We can also further chemically functionalize our material. So uh, add amine functionality or silane functionality, for example, or any other functionality that's, uh, that is relevant. So a wide range of uh, chemical facilities and structure we can access. And in terms of our material, it's fully dispersible in a wide range of polar solvents. Uh, so water, ethylene, glycol, DMF, IPA, for example. And the video that's hopefully now playing shows how easy it is to disperse and dilute in water. So here's just showing a, a five mil per milliliter sample being diluted. So ready disperses in water, which is a key feature in terms of its application potential and its use in many different applications that, uh, that we serve. So of those areas, we're active actually in a wide range of verticals. Um, so for example, polymer additives from mechanical strength, for example, um, water filtration, which you'll see in many people's examples, um, drug delivery, energy storage, barrier properties, conductive inks, are all applications where our graphene, graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide can be suitable. Today, I'll talk to you a little bit about energy storage. So we have a good example, which really combines our functionality with inorganic materials with graphene oxide for solving some problems in energy storage for lithium-ion batteries. So we're currently active in, in various R&D consortia, as well as commercial and sales activities. So to talk about batteries then and lithium-ion batteries, then the issue is at the moment, most, most lithium-ion batteries use graphite as the anode. 
um, which is stable, it's conductive, it works nicely, except there's a limitation in terms of capacity. So as people want the longer range vehicles, for example, then graphite just isn't good enough for capacity. So there is a need to look to alternative materials. Silicon is, is, is a contender, as are many inorganic compounds. So many inorganic oxides, for example, the kind of materials that uh, we might make in our, in our plant, our tin and copper plant. Um, so metal oxides have superior theoretical capacity to graphite, but they suffer from a major disadvantage as pure materials, which is that they undergo massive volume changes during charging and discharging. So with time, that leads to pulverization of the anode and massive reduction in capacity. So it's not possible to swap out graphite with a copper oxide or a tin oxide or a nickel oxide and get the same performance because eventually the battery destroys itself. So the volume changes progressively reduce the battery capacity in lifetime, which gives the need for a solution to actually stabilize those materials. So the principle is, is by using reduced graphene oxide as a layer, as a restrictive layer that coats the particles, this can potentially get all the benefits of the capacity of the inorganic material, but reduces the problem of volume change by constricting those changes that are, that are likely to happen. So if it's possible to actually get inorganic compound around the uh, graphene oxide around the inorganic compound, then potentially there's a way of making the inorganic compound reach its full potential. And here's where the beauty of graphene oxide comes in. So a lot of these inorganic oxides are made using precipitation chemistries in, 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 in water. So mix reactants, um, precipitate out the, the metal oxide, separate it, and that's your material. Well, the nice thing about graphene oxide is that it can be put actually in a reaction during the process. So as the, uh, the metal oxide or the metal compound is forming, then graphene oxide is actually there present in solution. You can then add either hydrazine, for example, to chemically reduce the graphene oxide to reduce graphene oxide, or in a process, uh, post-process step, you can thermally reduce it. So potentially it's possible to add graphene oxide very, very easily in the process step, form the inorganic active material, and then end up with either post-processing or a further chemical step, the appropriate functional form of graphene oxide, which is the reduced graphene oxide. And furthermore, by actually changing the process conditions and the chemical conditions, it's possible to get different kind of morphologies. So for example, it's possible to get inorganic materials co-precipitating with graphene oxide to make an intimately mixed material, it's possible by getting the ratio of sizes right and the reactant concentrations right to wrap graphene oxide and then reduce it to get reduced graphene oxide around the inorganic. And furthermore, it's possible then to get layers of graphene oxide with small nanoparticles on top of them. So by very simple changes in process conditions and reactant conditions, it's possible to mix graphene oxide in, get multiple different morphologies and get the appropriate function at the end of it. In our case, we're looking at wrapping, but uh, it's easy to get other morphologies as well. So the work that we're looking at here is uh, published last year. It was work done with the National Graphene Ox Institute with uh, Professor Dreif in Manchester. And it was looking at our copper oxide that we produce and seeing how that actually mixes with graphene oxide and then can be reduced to improve the performance of anodes and the electro electrochemical performance um, with reduced graphene oxide. So you can read this, so this paper, the reference is here for you to look at later. I'll take out some highlights from the paper just to give you a view for how it so the principle is, uh, in the paper, we looked at uh, different conditions. The very basic situation was to take uh, the reactants, form copper carbonate, and then calcine that to make copper oxide, that's the base material. And we then looked at different variations of adding graphene oxide and reducing it to make a reduced graphene oxide and copper oxide mix to see if we got better performance in anodes made with those materials compared to copper oxide by itself. And the control sample is one where we have a carbon source from glucose. So today the results I'll show, this is about an hour's presentation in its own right, but the, the results I'll show today are basically the, the copper oxide material compared to one of the routes whereby we added graphene oxide into the reactant feed and formed a copper carbonate and graphene oxide, then further reduced that to make a reduced graphene oxide copper oxide mix. And you'll see the Raman shifts there show the presence of graphene oxide in all of those samples where we expect it to be, so it, it works in terms of forming graphene oxide. And, uh, we can add that to copper oxide. So the SEMs look like this. Here's the pure copper oxide by itself. Um, very beautiful spherical kind of aggregates of uh, spicular crystals radiating out in a, in a spherical kind of a morphology. However, when we look at the electrochemical performance in the anode, we'll see the starting capacity is pretty much as expected. But after about 45, 46 cycles of uh, charging and discharging the battery, 
then we see reduction to less than 80% of the capacity that's, uh, that's there originally. So that's a benchmark, that's the standard. Once the capacity goes below 80%, then the battery is seen as uh, getting to the end of its life. So clearly 40 cycles, 45 cycles isn't good enough for commercial application. Therefore, copper oxide by itself isn't good enough to use by itself. So we now look at graphene oxide added to these, uh, the, the, the copper oxide and then reduced. And what you'll see highlighted for the arrows in the SEM is the sheets of graphene oxide actually you're wrapping around the copper oxide structures. Uh, in this case, it's obviously reduced. It's been, it's been uh, heat, heat treated afterwards. Um, it's worth noting here that uh, sometimes people think because it's a 2D material, they think of graphene oxide and graphene as very rigid, very plate-like materials. It's actually highly flexible. So these sheets will wrap themselves around the crystal structures. Um, and the flexibility is actually important for a whole range of applications. So if we think about mechanical applications or barrier um, or coating applications or even lubrication applications, a lot of those actually rely on graphene oxide being a very flexible 2D material, not just a 2D material in its own right. So we see here adding a bit of graphene oxide, 2% in this case, allows these sheets to wrap themselves around the crystals, which is uh, what we're hoping for, what we expect. And if we now look at the electrochemical performance, we do indeed, indeed see that this leads to an increase or an improvement in performance. So I should say this is still not good enough to make it a fully commercial material. It still lasts for only 60 cycles before, before we get to the 80% reduction in uh, capacity. But clearly it's a step in the right direction. If we now look at what happens when we add a bit more graphene oxide, so this is the same technique. So graphene oxide in one of the reactant feeds makes copper carbonate. Calcine that to make reduced graphene oxide and copper oxide. We now see is a higher res sample. So we see the actual crystal structure of the copper oxide is a bit different as we start to go to uh, graphene oxide additions. That's because we're changing the other additions. But we see here a fully wrapped sample. So if you look at this uh, this, this micrograph, you'll see um, that the fuzzy grey areas include the, gra the reduced graphene oxide sheet wrapping themselves around the crystal structure of the copper oxide. Really interestingly, if we look closely, you'll now see, I think Rune showed this for titanium dioxide just now in his presentation. We'll see here how the copper oxide is actually precipitated onto the graphene oxide sheet. And we actually have a secondary structure of nanoparticles of reduced or of copper oxide on reduced graphene oxide. So by changing the reaction conditions, in this case, by changing the graphene oxide concentration in the feed, it's possible to get this secondary structure. So not only do we have a wrapping of graphene oxide around the copper oxide, we also have a templated structure as well. So this just shows actually how it's relatively straightforward to start to play with process conditions and reaction conditions and chemistries to get, these, to get these different morphologies. And these kind of templated structures, as well as being useful for potentially increasing capacity in batteries, they're also interesting for things like catalysis, for example, or for antiviral or antimicrobial applications where you might want to support your active material on, on an active support like graphene oxide. So this is the kind of thing that's a lot more difficult to do with graphene by itself, but the fact we can mix graphene oxide with these water-based chemistries mean we can relatively easily produce morphologies we couldn't get any other way. And furthermore, if we now look at the electrochemical performance of these materials, it's pushed out even further. So the 5% graphene oxide, as maybe would be expected, more graphene oxide, more wrapping, a tighter structure around the crystal structure around the copper oxide leads to even greater stability. So in this case, it's still not good enough to be a commercial sample, but it shows, again, we're on the right direction towards getting a more stable structure. So the initial copper oxide was stable to about 40, 45 cycles. We've now um, got to 70 or more cycles of stability by this wrapping phenomenon. Now, to show you it's not just uh, exclusive to copper oxide, the next slide shows some data for tin oxide. So we can take different materials. Here's a tin oxide sample. Um, and then the same thing, wraps it with graphene oxide reduced to form reduced graphene oxide to make the wrapped uh, control structure. And you'll see again the capacity decrease that, that happens for tin oxide by itself is much more stable when it's wrapped in graphene oxide and then reduced to make reduced graphene oxide. And to show it's not just about oxides, the last example to show you how it works is uh, tin pyrophosphate. So this is uh, yet the same phenomenon for the tin pyrophosphate by itself, we see this massive fall in capacity, very rapid fall. As we start to wrap it with reduced graphene oxide, the same thing happens. Uh, it's a consistent phenomenon. We wrap the inorganic structure with reduced graphene oxide, get greater stability, prevent these volume changes, and you increase the capacity, increase the stability of the battery. So it's a way of introducing in inorganic functionality 
and uh, graphene oxide functionality in a very straightforward way and improving the performance of your end product. So we've got many examples across different industries. We can talk about other ones as well, but uh, for all those applications, we have application data that demonstrates that uh, adding graphene oxide and or reducing to reduce graphene oxide does give uh, demonstrated benefits. Underpinning this is a high quality uh, material and we're really ready for many challenges, uh, very much as Rene said, lots of application areas to look at, a lot of potential. Um, interesting thing, graphene oxide, it's not always a replacement for graphene. Graphene oxide, when it's reduced, often the properties aren't quite as good as graphene, but often they're good enough. So the ability to easily process, then make functional, is a real, is a real selling point, a real benefit of graphene oxide. So with that, thanks for your attention, and here's my contact details. If you want to find out about ourselves, um, look on our website, uh, dedicated graphene oxide website, I'll tell you about geo, um, contact myself for more application data, very happy to talk about any of these aspects, including our inorganic materials. Thank you very much, Terence. Back to you. Well, Mike, thank you. And um, again, your presentation just underscores what we've already seen is that uh, graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide are extremely flexible materials that can be used in many different applications. And I think you... Um, you're able with, with your detailed presentation um, to really um, show why. So we're, we're going to go through uh, some Q&A uh, questions here. The question, so one of, one of the questions that we had was um, using uh, graphene in uh, aqueous acrylic applications and uh, making, making, the, uh, making those materials electrically conductive. Um, or at least anti-static. And so, uh, and this would be a question for any of the three of you, um, and I know this has come up in other applications wherever color is important. So we're adding, uh, adding graphene materials at low load factors. Um, do any of you have any experience with using uh, graphene, let's say in, in coatings or paint, um, to achieve anti-static or electrically conductive uh, materials, um, how it affects the color? Uh, uh, let me answer it. If we apply the GO on the textiles or fabrics, so it, it becomes a little like a yellow brown, but we can figure out that there is some, some powders like things, but at least it is transparent. So, so we can easily see that it is transparent. So unless we look deeply into the textile using optical microscope, we cannot see anything so because it is transparent okay but by using the optic optical microscope we can figure out there is some yellow brown things so uh, if we use a go the color change is not significant but if we use all go for the coating of some materials but then it becomes black easily even okay. though we uh, apply very low weight percentage, generally, generally. So th this is as a coating on a textile. Yeah. Okay. And what about um, what about other applications? I don't know, Rune or, or Mike, if you have experience with using these in um, in coatings. So most of our coating applications, again, it, it depends very much on the concentration and the thickness and the formulation, actually. So we have some applications at low loadings where it effectively is transparent to the naked eye. We had other applications where, as uh, Dr. Bayon says, you start to get a yellowish or a brownish tint to it. So it very much is application dependent. Okay. And Rune, do you have any... When we worked with the transparent conductive coatings, the requirement was that I think 50, 80 or 85% of the light should pass through, which corresponds to about... Um, 10 layers of graphene right because each layer of perfect graphene would absorb two percent of the light right so so that's that brings up another application the original question was about you know uh, more like a colorant a kind of acrylic coating um, but when you mentioned uh, transparent electrodes which is yet another application then uh, you're right you're you're in that two percent per layer of carbon uh, feature. Um, Dr. Bayan, there was a question that came up about textiles in particular, and if anybody's been able to actually incorporate graphene into the into the fibers themselves. So this would be like melt mixing or, or into the polymer before the fibers are spun. 
Um, I know that there are some applications or companies that have done that. Have you, have you had any experience with that? Into the polymers, not coding, you mean? Yeah, so that it, so it's incorporating graphene right into the fiber material itself, so it becomes part of the fiber as opposed to a coating. Right. Uh, yeah, there are, uh, we have some experiences, especially in terms of the strength enhancement. So we, uh, we have some experience about the PET fibers plus our RGO powders in order to have an enhanced str mechanical strength. And not, not, this is not related to antistatic things. So in terms of the strengths, so the uh, tensile strength has been increased about uh, 30 to 40% by incorporating our RGO powders. And other, uh, so uh, generally related to uh, mechanical strengths, antistatic and antibacterial things. Yeah. Excellent. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pose a question to, to each of the speakers a little differently because we have so many questions coming in. So, Mike, I'm going to, I'm going to see if maybe you can handle this one. Um, there's a question regarding using uh, GEO or RGO for, uh, for membranes, for polymer membranes. Have you, do you have any experience with membranes in particular for, like, food applications? So I actually have experience from my previous job actually in, in, in that space um, in terms of barrier properties. Um, so yes, I mean, gra so interesting graphene oxide and graphene um, for membranes and barrier properties, it's actually a relatively interchangeable application in many respects. So there are some applications where graphene is absolutely essential. You need the electrical con conductivity, for example, or particular thermal conductivity. There is some where what you need is, is a flexible 2D material that can overlap and overlayer in which case adding layers of the right size, so flex size is very, very important here, and formulation is very important, it's possible to get here a, a multi-layer barrier material on polymer membranes, for example. So mm -hmm. graphene oxide is a nice example here where it's relatively interchangeable with graphene in that respect. So let's continue on with some of the questions. One of them, um, Mike, I'll stick with you on this one, because you mentioned the, uh, the battery applications, and hopefully Rooney can come back because he also had the uh, the graphene uh, sulfur uh, or the lithium sulfur battery applications um, are you are you have you seen this go into production yet or what what is the commercialization stage are you working with battery manufacturers at the at this point so a variety of projects um, some private and confidential others are public domain they're part of um, funded consortia um, this is very much uh, low TRL so it's very much early stage looking at uh, getting application data and demonstrating the feasibility. So as you saw from my presentation, I, mean, I showed the public domain information from a published paper, which uh, those materials clearly weren't commercially viable because the, 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 the um, stability wasn't good enough, even with a graphene oxide wrapping. But there are various other tweaks and, and, and things you need to do in terms of reaction condition and so on and processing that would then improve performance. So these are very much early stage development projects, but um, compared to what comes up with silicon, for example, which is the lead candidate, but they're still very much viable for certain niche applications. So the battery sector, I mean, this is worth hours of discussion in its own right. The battery sector is complex because there are many niche applications as well as the mainstream automotive electric, electric vehicle applications. Um, and each one often needs a certain type of cathode or anode material or certain specialty material. Uh, and that's often where graphene oxide and graphene might fit in. So I think Rune talked about lithium sulfur for drones, for example, which is a niche application for, for, for batteries. Lithium sulfur is, is clearly very, very suited for those kind of applications. Probably less so for... Uh, mainstream automotive um, likewise inorganic uh, inorganic metal oxides same kind of thing so they all have the niche to fill um, but they're very much earlier mm -hmm. stage than the later stage I would say at the moment thank you Mike and Rune uh, thanks for rejoining us we we were just talking about uh, graphene for batteries and you had mentioned the the lithium sulfur battery uh, chemistry that you you are working on um, do you know if that's actually been applied in any uh, commercial applications yet, or what is the stage of development of that of that chemistry? There is a company in England that makes um, lithium sulfur batteries that are um, used in some um, drones. I think they are called Sapphire. They fly at 15 kilometer height. The extra expense is compensated by the the length of each flight. Now that people talk about electric uh, aviation from 2035, I think there will be a lot of interest in sulfur batteries. Well, we know, I can, I can share with you, there, there's tremendous interest in the aviation sector for electrification, and drones is a good place to start. 
Um, I do know that, um, you know, the key performance metric that they're looking at is something called dwell time, basically how long can the drone stay aloft, right? Mm. And so that, that weight to uh, energy density uh, ratio is extremely important. And then, of course, Rolls-Royce has just come out with an electric drive uh, uh, airplane. We have Pilatus in Switzerland that has made a passenger plane that's all electric, 100% electric. So we see a lot of advances. And even, uh, we should not forget, not just for the propulsion systems, but for all the onboard electronics and aviation and uh, in using uh, batteries is interesting. And to switch gears slightly, we talked about the barrier properties of graphene. Um, there is a large initiative looking not necessarily at batteries, but actually hydrogen as a power source for, uh, for aircraft in actually generating electrical power. And then graphene comes into play again, uh, for example, with pressure vessels and, uh, and the ability to contain hydrogen, which is yet another uh, feature of this material that we haven't touched on yet. I'm going to come back to you, Dr. Bayan, if I could. Um, we've also seen at the Graphene Council, because we get contacted by companies all the time about different ways of potentially using graphene, a lot of interest in the fiber space again. And so one of the questions we have from the audience is, what is the actual process for coding? Um, th there's a term of art in the, in the fiber industry called uh, sizing, right, is to place uh, graphene on, on the surface of the fibers in order to make them incorporate better and, and after, after you respond, I'd like to go back to Rune for a second because uh, you, you caught my attention, Rune, when you talked about doing a graphene oxide coating on glass fiber. Um, mm -hmm. And we're doing, uh, the Graphene Council is doing a graphene enhanced composites testing project at the moment in which we are going to test um, graphene enhanced resins in a neat formulation in a carbon fiber uh, reinforced uh, part piece and also a glass fiber reinforced piece. And so, you know, looking at putting uh, graphene in the resin, but you, th that approach you mentioned is actually putting graphene on the fiber itself. So Dr. Bayan, can you talk to us a little bit about the process of putting carbon on these, uh, these fibers and, and what is the chief uh, performance metric you're trying to achieve when you're doing this? So uh, actually uh, in terms of the fiber, uh, fiber things, so we are in kind of initiation stage and we are trying to apply our several kinds of product to various kinds of fibers. But uh, so far, uh, it is like a confidential because we are preparing some commercialization. So <laughs> okay, that's a that's a common theme with graphene. There's there's there is so much more, and this is a little bit frustrating for us sometimes. There is so much actually going on in development inside companies and we even have uh, very large member companies in the graphene council that we don't disclose that they're members of the council because they're working on graphene um as as a you know as an innovative technology and they don't want anybody to know that they're even working on it um but there's a, so there's a lot more going on but sorry you can't share that but uh, rune can you talk a little bit about the the, uh, the glass fibers and the coatings and, and you know why why are you doing that and and has it been applied to any applications yet yeah, the last thing first, we haven't really tested yet, but we have um, <clears throat> idly, the, the coating should be only one, one layer of graphene. So with a few grams, you could coat kilograms of, uh, of uh, glass fibers. Yeah. And uh, the idea is to convert the surface of the glass from being hydrophilic to hydrophobic. Okay, okay. So well, that I don't makes sense. Think it, would, uh, it would not affect the strengths or anything, but the adhesion between the polymer and the gla glass. Yeah, that's quite that's quite interesting. I, and I and I think you know from the composite side, I know things like interlaminar shear is quite important. Impact resistance is quite important. We know that the fibers are the primary strengthening agent in those composites, so that that's quite interesting. Um, you know, we we could sit here all day because I know we've got so many questions. I haven't got back back to these yet. But I'm also conscious we're, we're over an hour's time already. Um, and, and I just want to say uh, thank you to each of the presenters for contributing today. And I want to really encourage the following. I know that we have a lot of folks from the academic sector, and we have a lot of people from you know, commercial applications that are looking at graphene, that if you have uh, specific questions you want to learn more or you'd like to obtain uh, you know, amounts of material 
uh, from commercially produced graphene oxide materials for experimentation or evaluation or prototyping is to please reach out to uh, the, these members of ours um, who are experts in this field and have the ability to also work with you to tune the material. I want to share just one thing b before I say goodbye. You know, many of you who are on this call are members of the Graphene Council. I want to reiter reiterate the benefits of being a member of the Graphene Council is that we have the world's largest global network. We do a weekly, weekly graphene intelligence newsletter, which has commercial developments, patent filings, and recent research uh, reported. We're focused on the commercialization of this, which means how to unlock the potential this amazing material has for many, many, many different commercial applications. And by working through the Graphene Council and our network with our university partners and our graphene producers, we are very confident we can save commercial R&D time and money to get you to an application quicker and with fewer mistakes or a learning process um, to unlock this material. And so we have uh, membership opportunities that are for individuals or for universities and research organizations or for corporations. And we really encourage you and invite you to consider joining and being part of the Graphene Council. We also produce a 600-page graphene report, which is kind of like the graphene Bible. It's been referred to, which talks about production methods, commercial forms of material, market pricing, applications, uh, characterization methods, and a review of more than 200 companies that produce graphene material. And if you want to learn more about joining, uh, simply go to jointgc.org and you'll learn more there. So gentlemen, would you like to just say uh, any last words before we sign off today? So uh, thanks everyone for attending and uh, listen, just seeing the comments coming through. So thanks for your kind comments about uh, you clearly enjoyed the presentation. But um, yeah, hopefully the message you get is graphene oxide can be similar to graphene, but in many respects, it's very different material. Um, hopefully the ease of processing and uh, its use is, uh, is attractive for many people listening. So uh, please get in touch. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Dr. Bayan? Uh, thank you for everyone for listening and giving me a kind attention. Yeah, I thank you all and we, are, we will try to keep our work on the special development of high quality graphene powders. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, and thank you especially because of the late hour in uh, in Korea this evening to join us live. So we really do appreciate that. Thank you. And Rune. Yeah, th thank you for everybody for attending, and thank you, Terence, for arranging this webinar. Feel free to contact us. Rune, thank you. Well, I hope this was informative for you as we focused on graphene oxide and its applications. And if you have questions about any aspect of graphene, feel free to contact us or any of the speakers that you saw today. So with that, thank you very much. We appreciate your attending and being part of the Graphing Council Global Community.